Welcome to Charity Village Connects. As Canada prepares for the second annual National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, which coincides with the grassroots initiated Orange Shirt Day on September 30th, we ask Indigenous leaders how the nonprofit sector can be a better partner with and support Indigenous led organizations and communities. And what should organizations and nonprofit professionals understand about their role in the journey towards reconciliation? Joining me today is Peter Dinsdale, President and Chief Executive Officer of YMCA Canada, a post in which he's proven his commitment to transforming Canada through the power of community and healthy living. Dinsdale has worked and volunteered for service delivery and political advocacy organizations on a local, regional and national level, and has devoted his life to improving the lives of Indigenous communities and supporting reconciliation. Welcome to Charity Village Connects, Peter. Thanks so much, Mary. As CEO of YMCA Canada, can you talk a little bit about your organization's reconciliation journey and how and when did the organization commit to this journey towards reconciliation? Well, I became CEO of uh, YMCA Canada in 2016 after uh, an entire career, frankly, with Indigenous organizations, never outside. And uh, coming in, I was on the board at YMCA Canada for a couple of years prior to becoming CEO and uh, lots of conversations about what can happen around reconciliation. But I will say that time, probably not unlike today, there was a lot of uh, nervousness about making a misstep, doing the wrong things, not sure how to move forward. Um, so in 2017, then into 2018, we developed a national statement of reconciliation that talked about our commitment to working with Indigenous peoples and communities that wanted to work with us and what role that YMCAs in particular could provide and uh, could play in reconciliation. Um, we're clear that you know we're not responsible for uh, 400 years of colonization, but we're responsible for what we do today and how we move forward. And that's what our statement was all about. And encouraging local wise to take action because you know my view is reconciliation will only be meaningful when it happens on the ground through meaningful actions. So um, all of our work was really around preparing local YMCAs for that journey. Uh, we did things like um, having our entire national delegation, including, you know, representatives from each YMCA, their board chair, youth and CEO to go through the Kairos blanket exercise, which really touches them emotionally. They understood it intellectually, wanted to make sure that they felt it um, emotionally. And it was a great opportunity to hear from Indigenous leaders about the impact that organizations like the Y uh, could have with them and understand that they did have a role. So uh, it continues to be a work in progress. I don't want to suggest that we have it all figured out, but... Uh, we started uh, in 2018 and we continue to learn and continue to grow. I'm curious about whether your organization has sort of embedded the kind of reconciliation work in your organization's infrastructure, such as governance and leadership, staffing, um, th those kinds of elements that are trans transformative in terms of the organization itself, not just the way in which they work with uh, external uh, stakeholders. I mean, like I say, it's a journey. I don't want to suggest that we're at that spot right now. Um, I think our journey includes clearly this work in reconciliation, but it includes in all elements of diversity of uh, organizations and services that we provide. I think, of course, you know, many of our facilities and health, fitness and aquatics facilities are in some of the more privileged neighborhoods in all the cities and towns across Canada. How do we make sure that our organizations and our service providers look like the community we serve? are governed by the community we serve uh, and are accessible to all the communities that we serve and people that really need us. Um, when I came to YMCA again in 2016, um, I was really struck by their mission, uh, which was the Canada we want and the YMCA we need. It was a bigger ambition than to just be the best health, fitness and aquatics facility or the best um, child care provider or the best charity. It was about actually making change in Canada. And that's part of the organization I wanted to be part of. So. Um, again, everyone's committed to that goal. Um, there's certainly a process in place. So we embed, um, of course, this, the easier stuff like land acknowledgements and inviting elders to come to meetings and how do we outreach. The harder work is how to make sure, again, that um, our board is representative of, yes, Indigenous peoples in their territories, but, uh, you know, racialized people, people of color, disability people, their sexual orientations, all of the above, because it makes our organizations better when we do. So as you say, um, YMCA Canada is a, is a national umbrella organization with local YMCA chapters across the country. 
Um, I'm curious whether you have any examples of current initiatives that are underway, um, either at the national level or the local level, um, to uh, to support this uh, this journey towards reconciliation. Perhaps you could give our audience some examples of that. Yeah, for sure. I think nationally, we really realized early on, uh, given the nervousness and people not wanting to make missteps, the importance of the national organization providing training and support for local wise. So a lot of it was about what does Indigenous cultural competency look like? Uh, we would have a, we had an education series. We'd have ongoing webinars and education series on. You mentioned uh, September 30th, Orange Shirt Day. We had Phyllis Webstead, the founder, come and speak to our wives. Um, after the inquiry to missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, we had one of the commissioners uh, come speak to WISE about what the report meant and what it meant for our work moving forward. Uh, we continue to do these kinds of work because, again, I think there's a lot of eagerness and willingness to be involved, but a lot of nervousness about how to proceed and, and really what's uh, moving forward. So the nationally, we've been really focused on that capacity and training development. Locally, we're seeing a number of initiatives underway, which is quite encouraging. Uh, in places like Calgary, they have a cultural staff that goes into um, public schools to help Indigenous you know, students um, learn how to put on a powwow and regalia making and, and cultural competency themselves directly in the community. And that's a YMCA initiative. We're seeing other initiatives like from YMCA's across southwestern Ontario work in the Indigenous communities with their camps around the names of the camps and around bringing elders in the community to access so they can share, really trying to build an understanding of what that land is about, what has always meant. Uh, we're seeing lots of programming elements. So we have a, a youth mental health program in BC called, um, oh, I forget the name of it right now, but they, they actually have an indigenous uh, curriculum they worked with called Mind Medicine, uh, working with indigenous organizations to make sure it's available and acceptable uh, to indigenous communities. So we see a whole bunch of bright lights all across to, all across the country. One of the things that I would really like to see happen, by the way, is building YMCA facilities on reserve. Uh, in 2016, when I was moving to YMCA Canada, there was a suicide crisis in Attawapiskat where some young women had made a, a pact to kill themselves on a certain day, and thankfully it was prevented. Uh, and they brought in elders and counselors to ask the community what they need. And on top of one of the flip charts, they said they wanted a YMCA. And I think it, it, the YMCA just represented hope, a place to go, a place to be. Uh, we traveled up to Attawapiskat to meet with the community after seeing it, and uh, they ended up partnering with the province to build a different facility, but we're needed all across the country. And the real challenge is having organiz any nonprofit organization in a community that's isolated like Attawapiskat or any of the other 632 First Nations all across Canada. So we're really trying to work with partners in different communities to try to build a a, a, these YMCA centers of community so that youth and people in the community can benefit from it like Canadians do everywhere. So, I mean, there's so much that has been accomplished and those are wonderful examples. So thank you for sharing those. For organizations who have yet to embark on the journey, what advice do you have uh, to offer them? You certainly um, talked about, I guess, getting beyond this fear of making missteps, but where would you see that the best way for them to start? Yeah, and I think we're advantaged. And again, we don't have it all figured out, but I think we're advantaged because I came from the community. I understood how to navigate it. And I appreciate it. if you don't have that uh, entry point, it can be challenging and it can be nerve wracking. I think the first most important thing are relationships. Uh, if you're a local community, to make sure you're meeting with the, the communities, the First Nation, Métis, and Inuit communities, depending on where you're at, uh, and tell them what you do and ask them what they need and how can you work together? Are you wanted in that area? Is there space that's needed? How to provide space for Indigenous leaders themselves uh, to occupy leadership roles in your organizations, whether it's on your board or in your staffing? Um, I'd really encourage you know everyone to make sure that um, their services look like the community they serve. I mentioned some of our successes, but certainly one of our challenges that might resonate with people. Not long after we developed our statement of reconciliation, I was in a Y and I asked them, how's it going working with their Indigenous community? And the response I got was, it's not going great because they don't come here. And it wasn't intentional, but it's this idea that it's us and them. And it's not until we're together in one community um, and it takes a lot of work and it's not intentional. It's, uh, it's the impact of history of poverty, of not seeing YMCAs as someone that your family could go to, could afford to go to, or felt that was for them, or that the services were ever really directed for them that could be directed for someone else. So how, how do you break down that in your community? You break it down by inviting people in. They're no longer the other. You're doing that work together. 
Um, so we'll take hard work with your board uh, in terms of understanding the history. We'll take hard work with your staff uh, to make sure that there's not, you know, unconscious bias or different things going on, preventing people from access to programs and services. Um, but I would also say in Indigenous communities, it's okay to work with people and allow mistakes to happen. Things won't be perfect. And uh, we can't be waiting for a gotcha moment to jump on a, a misstatement. We have to work together through kindness and caring to find pathways forward. So um, I would encourage all organizations to start that first step of relationship building as difficult as it is and challenging as it can be. I think reaching out and having those conversations is a great way to begin. Well, I think the other aspect that is, is so interesting that I'm hearing from the leaders is really about uh, in a bigger picture, how indigenous ways of knowing can help actually transform the nonprofit sector itself and its current practices. You've sort of alluded to this about the, the two sides of the situation, us and them. Um, but, but I think that's a, even a bigger sort of picture when we look at the sector at large. What would you like the nonprofit sector to learn in this process? Well, I mean, there are certainly different cultural ways of knowing and being um, in Indigenous communities, and that's a part of the cultural competency training. I think so important when um, you understand how to work with communities. Um, personally, um, I was fortunate to work at the Ontario Federation of Indian Friendship Centers at a very young age and work with Sylvia Miracle that taught me so much about cultural-based management and culture-based competencies and how to use our traditional teachings like the Seven Grandfather teachings or Medicine Wheel teachings or others. Uh, to help inform our work and how we approach things, approach things in a balanced way, uh, approach things with humility, uh, approach things um, in a way that shows kindness and love, caring and compassion. Um, even your own leadership style. Uh, coming here, um, I've never been a command and control kind of leader uh, where all things need to flow through me and you know I'm the ultimate authority or all knowing, all seeing uh, CEO. Very much encourage my staff to own their areas and to. Uh, and it's just a way of being in leadership that, that I've been taught, whether implicitly or just through, uh, through mentors. And I don't think it was always received well at the outset. Um, they expected a command and control leader, uh, maybe that's always typically been in, in Western kind of organizations. So I think it's also making space for different leadership styles and ways of knowing and being. Um, yeah, but I think Canada's getting there. I think one of my lessons leaving, I used to be CEO at the Assembly of First Nations before I came uh, to YMCA Canada, I don't think I appreciated the extent to which Canadians are seized with this notion of moment of reconciliation. So much of my career has been trying to raise awareness and fighting around the treaty relationship and reconciliation and coming out and seeing how much people really are wanting to do the right thing. Uh, and we have a great opportunity to walk together to do that today. That's really encouraging um, to, to hear your observation um, of non-Indigenous um, uh, communities and people um, coming to terms and wanting uh, to address this. So perhaps you could give some suggestions of how non-Indigenous organizations, what they can do to support the National Truth and Reconciliation Day this year, the second year of its existence, and really what they should be doing all year round. Yeah, I mean, I think any day like that's a great opportunity to reflect on what you're already doing. I think if you only made a statement and put an orange shirt logo on your on your social medias, and uh, I think that would be hollow. So I think, uh, but the opportunity though is to, even if it's your first conversation, uh, to bring elders in, to bring community members in, to talk about the impact of, in this case, residential school in your community, or it could just be colonization more broadly, depending on, on where you're at, uh, to talk about the challenges and how we can work together. Uh, to commit to an education series, maybe locally or visiting particular sites or, um, but again, I think it's just that first step, whatever it is for you and have it as a part of this ongoing commitment um, to the community and to the people that you serve. So I'm curious, um, uh, of course, I think we should be talking at least uh, touch on uh, recent events. Um, I'd like you to share your thoughts uh, in whatever way feels comfortable about the recent papal visit and the apologies that were issued and what your thoughts are on whether or not they'll have an effect on reconciliation. If so, what kind of an effect? Um, you know, how did you experience um, the Pope's uh, visit to Canada? Well, it is challenging and conflicting, I will say. Um, part of my role at the Assembly of First Nations is I was there representative on the Truth and Reconciliation Committee 
uh, commission, sorry, all party committee. So, you know, sometimes people forget that Canada didn't wake up one morning and decide to reconcile with Indigenous peoples or the uh, the past residential school experience. It was actually a class action lawsuit brought forward by survivors, uh, of which the Assembly of First Nations was was one of the parties. So we had a seat on the committee that, that oversaw the TRC and other elements of the apology. Um, and it was in that work when I saw uh, survivors or elders that, you know, were both Catholic and Indigenous, um, how important um, it was to hear from the Catholic Church uh, that their apology, it meant a lot to them on their personal reconciliation journey. Um, of course, I get conflicted with words versus actions. Uh, it's great that the Pope came here and made an apology, you know, in, in Canada. Uh, their commitment during the TRC settlement of the class action lawsuit was to put a certain amount towards reconciliation efforts, which they've never paid. Um, there was a apparently a fundraising um, challenge that took place within the Catholic Church that was never um, completed, so they were unable to pay their full amount. Uh, and when you see the riches that the Catholic Church has, have you ever been to the Vatican or see it, it's hard to reconcile between what they've done to our communities, uh, their accumulation of wealth and their inability or unwillingness to pay all those reparations. Um, but seeing the Pope come and make the apology here, um, I hope those elders and those survivors that needed to hear that for their personal healing, I hope that they get it. I hope that hearing the Pope, um, Pope's apology on behalf of elements of the church, and of course, didn't apologize on behalf of the church itself for their actions. It was people within the church. Uh, there's lots of commentary on the this notion the Catholic Church allowed for the doctrine of discovery through a papal bowl, that these were vacant lands that by virtue of a, you know, a, a white Christian being here made them Catholic lands at that point and available to take and exploit. Um, I'm not sure what net effect that would have in today's legal system to remove those papal bowls, but I think it would have been a great symbolic uh, move that's been done. Uh, but the truth is, uh, no amount of money and no amount of words will ever be enough. Um, the harm inflicted on people uh, by having their culture and their language taken from them, uh, by being sexually abused and being taken away from their homes and sent back to their homes and having those cycles start, um, no amount of words or money is going to overcome that. Um, see, for me, truth is one piece. We understand the truths that happened. There were some truths in the TRC process, but there is the reconciliation point. And how do you reconcile that? You have to reconstitute languages. You have to reconstitute language uh, nations. You have to reconstitute cultures. And that's some of the hard work that people in our community are doing. And sometimes I think they get prevented by their ongoing pain themselves and their personal healing that they have to go through. So my hope is that the Pope's visit and his apology here uh, provides those people uh, that comfort so they are able to move on. But the hard work will continue. Uh, the Pope's back in the Vatican and we're still here every day going through the exact same things that, that we that occurred previously. So uh, again, my hope is those people that needed that hope the most uh, heard that from the Pope and are ready to move on. That echoes certainly things that I've heard um, most recently for this podcast and other interviews that really it's a what's next and what uh, what concrete steps will be made. And I guess um, from your perspective, given your history in, in this journey, um, what do you think the appropriate next steps are, um, if that's not putting you too much on on <laughs> the spot in terms of, uh, uh, of, you know, what would you like to see? Well, it is the hard work of nation building. Uh, it is recognizing uh, Indigenous communities. And I'll speak First Nations specifically because I'm a member of Curve Lake First Nation in Central Ontario. Of course, the Métis Inuit will have their, their perspectives and incomparable uh, journeys. Um, but... You know, we were nations before colonizations and we remain nations afterwards. Um, we have an original treaty relationship with the crown uh, that included this notion that we are a nation with different uh, processes in place. And I think we have to find a way to understand what does that look like in te contemporary Canada? Um, it's not having uh, unclean drinking water. It's not having women murdered and missing. It's not having our education levels being what they're at or our justice systems and outcomes being what they're at. Um, how do we develop our own uh, governments, our own nations to provide services to our own people in our own ways? And we're seeing people do that hard work all across the country. Um, you think about the modern day treaties that have been signed and the ongoing work. I think that is the really important work that needs to happen. And again, it's these dysfunctions and unhealthy behaviors in our communities, which can be linked back to the residential school uh, experience, which has prevented a lot of this work from happening. But the real work has to take place in communities. 
Um, during the Charlottetown Accord, there is a debate that you know, um, Indigenous governments would be the third order of government, um, that there would be federal, provincial, and you know, Indigenous governments. I think today the language might be different than third order of government. It would be an order of government uh, with certain areas of responsibility, uh, certain areas you know, designated directly to Indigenous communities, so we're not being funded through contribution agreements for education programs, or we have the funding and support available um, around housing, or that the uh, extraction of natural resources and the taxes paid to different level of government support First Nation governments. These are tangible things we can do to develop the nationhood. It has nothing to do with the papal apology as an example. It has everything to do with the work that needs to happen in Canada moving forward. And do you see the nonprofit sector having a role in supporting these actions? And, and how can we support it as a as a sector itself? Yeah, well, there are issues in tax law around direction and control and qualified donees, which is, you know, particularly confusing, I think, uh, for a lot of Indigenous communities about the need for um, why aren't uh, First Nation governments automatically considered qualified donees like municipalities? I mean, it's a it's it's a bit of a patriarchal approach of the Application Income Tax Act, which and tangibly what it does is it prevents. Uh, First Nation communities from taking donations and writing receipts for those governments uh, for doing so, like all municipalities automatically have the right to do. Or under Indigenous uh, nonprofits understanding the need for qualified donee status and the process to go through. To what extent is CRA working with our communities to ensure that um, they are speaking to our communities in a way that makes sense and we understand and that they're being flexible and adaptable and are actually helping our people um, get those get those status. I think all nonprofits across the country have a mandate typically to serve their communities in their various areas. The, the communities include Indigenous peoples. The extent to which they have ignored or been unable to serve or not even thinking about serving those communities now is an opportunity to turn your attention to that and ask yourselves, you know, what is needed and how our services needed and how can we work together in partnership and hand in hand. So again, I think this reconciliation journey and how far it's come has been very, very helpful. We have a ways to go. Uh, but I'm quite encouraged by what I've seen. I think uh, the TRC report, um, I think all the attention it got, you think about uh, when, the, when this prime minister came in, not to be political, but certainly Harper had a different uh, political view on reconciliation than uh, Trudeau has um, with their mandate letters that there's no more important relationship than the nation to nation relationship with Indigenous peoples. The level of investment uh, in the federal budgets that have taken place, how this trickled down to provincial budgets and others how you're having this conversation, how all the civil society is seized by it. My only fear is that we've hit peak reconciliation, that there'll be a time that Canadians, you know, will be um, have had enough of this work and ready to move on because we really have a lot more work to do. And it's how do we sustain this effort as a country moving forward that I'm really interested in seeing happening. Well, um, you mentioned uh, the whole issue around non-qualified donees. And of course, you're familiar with B Bill S-216. And we actually did a... Um, uh, an episode about that. And uh, in essence, the substance of it was passed in the um, Budget Implement Implementation Act of uh, C-19. Um, I'm wondering whether you think, I mean, obviously, in it, it, the devil's in the details, and, and it'll be a lot about the implementation of that actual uh, new legislation, but what your thoughts are about whether it might impact the way the sector can better work with um, you know, on the ground community organizations uh, in Indigenous communities? Yeah, I think it can, absolutely. And I think it is the right approach. And, um, you know, I'm really, I've been appreciative of the Senator's efforts in bringing the bill forward and uh, seeing it push through. Um, again, I think, like you say, the devil is in the details. Um, let's see how do they outreach to the Indigenous communities. Let's see what CRA Charities Directorate does in terms of uh, making those um uh, making their services more accessible and friendly to the work that needs to happen. I think there's a lot of um, education and awareness that, that needs to happen within Indigenous communities in terms of the importance of qualified donee status and why bother going through. And I appreciate the flow through abilities that exist and uh, the direction and control notions that are being addressed and being uh, made simpler for our communities. I think a lot of foundations and charities have been very creative in terms of getting around some of those challenges and barriers which has existed. So the net change will be interesting to see um, at the end of the day. But that's not the only piece of work that needs to happen. I mean, you, you think about uh, the T3010 data that comes in and how can we mine it to say to your earlier question about what can we do? To what extent do the boards look like the communities they serve? Um, are they, how many Indigenous people are on boards all across the country? 
um, and again, helping them do those programs. So I think it's a great start. I think there's a lot more work that can be done as well. Uh, agreed. And and uh, I'm really quite intrigued with the, the sort of journey and the, and the transformation that's occurring in that regard and hoping that um, uh, the progress continues myself. Um, I wanted to uh, give you congratulations on your recent appointment to the Board of Directors of the Canadian Olympic Committee. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what that appointment meant to you personally? Well, thank you. And it was completely unexpected. Uh, when they reached out, I thought it was, uh, I got an email from someone and I actually thought it was spam. I thought, yeah, I'm not going to fall for that and click it because why would they be reaching out to me? Um, but, it, you know, it's a great honor to be to be contacted. It's very exciting work. Uh, they're a tremendous organization. Um, uh, the, the work they do and, you know, the Olympians, their Be Olympic uh, mantra is so uh, empowering and inspiring. I've only been to one meeting so far that was in this past June when I was first appointed uh, on the ability to meet uh, with them and hear about their work. Um, and they are deeply in this work of reconciliation, including potentially hosting the 2030 Olympics in BC with the four host nations. Um, and the ability to help and support that is, is, is quite incredible. I will say as well, you know, as much as there is these challenges in Canada uh, on this path of reconciliation or history of colonization, um, every time there's a Team Canada, um, everyone, including Indigenous people, are cheering for, you know, Team Canada to win, whether it's the men's gold medal hockey game or track and field events or boxing and all of the above. And we have Indigenous athletes that we hold up and celebrate. And my hope is that, you know, this ambition for excellence and this that, that includes Indigenous athletes, um, that includes the ability of our of our people to see themselves there and to understand that that's a place that they can and should be as well. I know there's a move as well to have uh, traditional games like lacrosse and other uh, Indigenous games or maybe having um, actually Indigenous teams represented at a certain level. So we're on this continuum and this work continues. Uh, but it certainly is an incredible honor to be a part of it and very humbling. There's there's so many great uh, people uh, in Canada that could be doing this work and I'll carry the torch for a while and then pass it on to the next one. Well, maybe you could give us a few more details about the Olympic bid by the four Indigenous First Nations in BC. Can can you talk about the precedence and importance of really such a historical bid and what it would mean for Indigenous Canadians should it be successful? Well, I mean, it is an incredible idea, of course, of Vancouver 2010, the four host nations had a really important part of those Olympics. And this change in 2030, that'd be the four host nations that would put on the Olympics and the Canadian Olympic Committee would support them in doing that. Um, I don't know fully what it means yet. And I think we're still understanding that together. Uh, but the idea that our nations could host the world in Canada or the Canadian Olympic Committee would support them, I think also shows the deep respect that can exist in Canada when we partner in a good way. And you can imagine uh, the kind of uh, hope that would bring again, uh, Indigenous people all across Canada and the world, frankly, and the world is watching uh, this approach. Um, and what this might mean for legacy events, what this might mean for facilities in communities. Was, there, there's so much that this could do and spinoffs that this could have. Uh, I'm really excited about this journey and, and to contribute in whatever way that I can. Well, I wanted to, uh give you an opportunity um, before we close today to leave for our listeners any last thoughts about what it means to pursue reconciliation um, and uh, any any parting advice you might want to leave them well I, I think the most important thing is to start your journey and if, if nothing else i've said today is just to, so people understand we don't have it all figured out either uh, we will make mistakes and and go down dead ends on occasion and then you know we will have successes here and there that it's that it is very much a journey, that there is no perfection. Uh, but the most important thing is to be on that journey and continue to learn, learn and grow as you go on, because I think this really is the hard work of nation building. Um, sometimes we can sit on the side and, and see different ways of it happening. This is an opportunity for uh, charities to be at the forefront of nation building and to do the work and to do your part of it. And this is a real opportunity for you to do so. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much.